I want you to hold your place there at uh, the book of Ruth, and I want you to go with me quickly to 1 Samuel in chapter number 17. I want to insert this into the beginning of this message. I pray that it would be a help and a blessing to you. I believe God would have me just to share a simple thought with you tonight. This is a, a new message. It's not a proven one. I didn't come to impress you. I came to help you tonight, and I pray the Lord would help me to do that. There's some embarrassing moments, certainly for a preacher, whenever he gets up before people like this. I, I remember one embarrassing moment. I was preaching. I was having a good time. I come close to the edge of the, edge of the platform, and there was about four feet to the floor there. And as I was walking, I put my foot down on the at a very high communion table that went all the way up to the top, almost to the top of the, to, to the stage. And I, I went to just barely step on it just a little bit. And when I did, that thing gave out and I went all the way to the floor. Now, let me just say this for any of you carpenters. If you're going to build a table, do us a big favor and put the legs all the way out to the corner and don't put them in the middle of the table. The legs had four legs on the inside of that and all the way out to the edge, all the way from here out to the center, was, was nothing but air. And that's about what I found. It, and very fortunate that I landed on my feet. I don't know, maybe I have a little bit of cat in me or something, but I made it. First Samuel chapter number 17, look with me please at verse number 8. Our church now, by the way, at base is at Calvary Baptist Church in Dundalk, Maryland. Our pastor is Cameron Giovanelli, and he came here, I think, in January, preached at the college. He has cancer. He's kidney cancer. He's 35 years old. I ask you to pray for him if you would. Look at verse number 8 with me if you would. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. He attributes that they are servants of Saul, not servants of God. And it's certainly maybe he was aware of the fact that Saul did not have a very courageous spirit, a very courageous uh, attitude that he had been hiding near the pomegranate tree. And so he announces it in this fashion. He comes out and he makes this speech in verse number 11. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were uh, dismayed and greatly afraid. It brought fear, drove fear into their heart. It scared them. And then in verse number 16, notice, if you will, that the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. In verse number 23, we find David going out. As David left the carriage, he goes down there to uh, meet up with his brethren and bring what his dad told him to bring. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistine, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. David heard them. Uh, go back with me, please, to Ruth now, if you would. David walked into a paralyzed situation. The people were fearful. They were dismayed. It hit me that uh, Goliath had made that speech 80 different times, 80 different times. Morning and evening, he came out and he presented himself two times a day for 40 days. 80 times he made that same speech. And it drove fear into their heart. But yet David came out and David had not become in tune with the negativity of the speech that was made. So David was not listening to what they were listening to. And so as David came out, David was fresh. He had a different attitude. He had a, a, a different thinking. The conversation, if you will, is going to be changed by David. David is going to say, is there not a cause? Certainly you and I understand that faith cometh by hearing and foundation comes from hearing the Bible and doing it, the Bible says. The book of Luke in chapter number 6, can't just hear it, you got to what? you got to do it. And that reestablishes things in our heart. So sometimes it's good to come, have someone come maybe with a different thought or different thinking. And that's what David did. Came with a different attitude and a different thinking. Well, there's a contrast in this particular story. Naomi has one way of thinking and Ruth has a different way of thinking. Two different trains of thought. Naomi was very discouraged by the circumstances that she has been forced to endure. She didn't ask for these circumstances. These circumstances have come to her. She didn't want them, but guess what? She's got to deal with them. They're hers now to deal with. 
What happened to her? Well, she goes down in a famine time with her husband and her two sons, and they go down to Moab just to sojourn for a little period of time. And as they're down there sojourning, some terrible circumstances happen to them, didn't they? She ends up losing her husband, and then she ends up losing her two husbands, or her two sons. And they now have left wives, and she gets the idea, hey, listen, I need to go to back to Bethlehem, Judah. And so she's going to get up, and she's going to go back. And Orpha says, hey, I'm going to, along the way, she tries to discourage these girls from following. And Orpha decides to turn back, but Ruth says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not going to turn back. Verse number 14, we find her lifting up her voice, and one leaves and the other. Hey, go back to your gods. Verse number 16, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She makes a to death do you part covenant with her. When she saw not when she heard, but when she saw, there was a determination in her. Her countenance gave her the understanding she wasn't leaving, that she was steadfastly minded to go with her. Then she left speaking unto her, and then they go back. But when they go back, certainly Naomi wants to have a different name. She wants to be called Mara. I think it's probably reasonable for you and I to to come to the understanding of why she would be sorrowful. Why would she be hurt? Why would she be discouraged? Why would she be dis depressed? And we don't have to talk about all the gory details and go over it. We can certainly understand that she needed some encouragement in her life. Go, if you will, please, holding your place here. Go with me to Proverbs in chapter number 15, please. Proverbs chapter number 15. It certainly is not encouraging, if you will, to talk about some of the gory details that she had to deal with. As it relates, a bomb went off in Boston. Shrapnel went everywhere. People were seriously hurt. Some were killed. And I really don't like to talk about the details. It's not likely to make me feel better to talk about the gory details. I don't have my head in the sand, but I don't want to watch all the news coverage. I'd rather spend my time with my kids than to follow all the depression and the inflation of emotions. That's just me. But most tragedies I've ever followed did make me feel better. They usually made me feel worse. Are you with me? As it relates. Notice the Bible, verse number 13, Proverbs chapter 15. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is what? It's broken. It breaks. She, she went away most likely, maybe energetic, leaving from the famine that they were experiencing. She left. She's energetic, hoping for a new life, hoping for a better life. But then when she got down, the circumstances that took place down in Moab didn't make her feel better. They made her feel what? Worse. She had a broken spirit. It's obvious that she came back to Bethlehem, Judah, with a broken spirit. But the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. The Bible says, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. The end of verse 14. Look at verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a what? A continual feast. A continual feast. I've watched uh, my pastor uh, go through this cancer, and it's amazing. You won't ever find him down and out and depressed. He seems to always be on the ups. I wrote out in my Bible, in one of my Bibles that I have, I wrote his name out there in, in my Bible that he always is having a continual feast. It's always like he's happy. You don't ever find him down and out. You don't find him discouraged. You always find him up. Proverbs chapter number 17, verse 22 says it this way, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A medicine. But a broken spirit drieth the bones. Now, which one do you think Satan would love you and I to live in? Come on now. You'll find it very difficult to gain, achieve, obtain, or acquire a merry heart by listening to the evening news. Come on now. What I like about Naomi is that she knew the place that she had left from, and she knew where she needed to get back to. I like that about her. She may not have known how it was all going to work out, but she knew where she needed to get back to. She was headed in the right direction to return back to Bethlehem, Judah. Yet it was not getting back to the place... 
It was not about getting back to the place. She needed to return to a state of mind. It's not simply being at the place. It's having the right state of mind being at that place. She's got to get back to Bethlehem, Judah with the right thinking, have the right heart about this thing. But she's not there yet. Naomi knew where she needed to get back to, and Ruth refused to stay where it was that Naomi told her she ought to stay. And the Bible gives us the understanding that they needed one another. The Bible's going to show us that. They both already had their mind up, made up about what they were going to do when they got back. They both wanted a new identity. Now listen to this, but they both didn't want the same thing. Ruth didn't want to be the Moabitess any longer. She wanted to get away from that past life. She wanted to get away from those gods. She wanted to get away from those things. And we find that with regards to Naomi, she wanted a new identity also. Who did she want to be? I want to be Mara. Don't call me Naomi anymore. I want you to call me Miserable Mara. I like my bitterness. I'm going to enjoy it. This is who I want to be. And so she's decided to sit and sour and soak and be depressed when she got back to Bethlehem, Judah. However, even though Ruth also had lost a husband, she was determined to work and to get a life back that she felt like maybe she had lost. She liked her name, and she chose to identify with Bethlehem, Judah. And these two women are going to share, if you will, an experience, but from two different mindsets, and God's going to bring this thing together. I heard this passage preached years ago by an evangelist that I admire very greatly. And he gave the understanding in the message that the reason that Naomi pushed Ruth and Orpha away was because he, he felt like that, that she wanted them to be committed to the journey. Don't get on this journey unless you're going to be committed to it. So she pushed them away, really meaning for them to come. And really what she wanted was, I want you to come with me, but I'm going to push you away, hoping that by pushing you away, you'll want it even more so. Well, however, God showed me something different about it. God showed me that the reason she was pushing Ruth away is she simply didn't want the responsibility. I don't want the responsibility of you. She didn't want the Ruth ministry. She didn't want to have to minister to this woman, so she's pushing her away. Why? Because she's acting like this thing is over with. What's the hope? I can't have any more children. If I could have any more children, would you stay around to have those children? Would you stay around to have another husband? I'm sorry that God has treated me this way. Get away from me. I don't want you. She didn't want the responsibility of the Ruth ministry. She had an identity crisis. She's embracing a negative identity, a Ident an identity crisis. Death and disaster in her life produced a, a disillusionment which led to a depression and, and discouragement. And she's embracing this wholeheartedly. In addition, Ruth the Moabitess might have reminded Naomi about the past that she was trying to forget. I don't want to remember the things that happened down in Moab. I want to get out of there. If she'd had a picture of Moab, she might have tore it up. You ever seen somebody tear up a picture of somebody that they used to like? Amen? They tear it up. How many of you ever seen it come back in and seen that same picture taped back together again? Amen? Where they tore it up. <laughs> Indecision. Amen? One minute I don't like being with you, the next minute I do, and it's, I guess it's good to have, maybe have terrible pictures. I don't know. Ruth would remind her of a past that she wanted to forget. Now remember, she's thinking past tense. Used to be. It was like this. Naomi determined that it was over, that it was done, that it was finished. Listen, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. She had an identity crisis. It's easier to be depressed if you sit and stare at the wall. However, it's very difficult to be depressed while ministering to other people. It's very difficult to be depressed, if you will, after you've got through finish and telling somebody else about how they can be saved. They admit that they're a sinner. They call upon Jesus. They receive Christ as their Savior. It's going to be hard for you to be depressed during a time like that. Amen. Amen. Come on now. Hey, listen, that's good news we're shouting about where I come from. Amen. That's good stuff. Now, I want you to think Jesus himself is witnessing. He's witnessing himself to the woman at the well, and when he gets through, this woman accepts who he is as the Savior, and he was not discouraged when he told his disciples this, I have meat that you know not of. I'll tell you something, guys. I don't need that earthly meat. I got another meat that's heavenly meat, and you all ought to get in on some of that. He had a different attitude. Ministry will take away or will rep replace misery. 
A preacher told once many years ago that whenever he felt like uh, he was depressed and down and out, he said, I'd always go soul winning. He said, it always made me feel a whole lot better. Amen. It's a simple, but it's a very powerful solution. Uh, we don't have time to share this entire story, so let me hasten on. Look at chapter number two here in the book of Ruth. And let's just highlight some good parts about this if we can, okay? Look at uh, uh, verse number one. You'll go with me in this now that we have an introduction. Look at verse 1. Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth and of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find, say that word with me, grace. One more time, grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Ruth decided to, now watch this, go grace hunting. Hey, if things aren't good, go grace hunting. Have you ever went grace hunting before? How many of you ever went grace hunting before? I have. Amen. You go looking for some grace. Naomi's reply, what is it? Go. Now, remember, she's trying to get rid of her, so she's glad. If you're going to get out of the house, why don't you go? She didn't want to bring her back to Bethlehem, Judah anyways. So go. Good riddance. Get out of the house. I don't want you around here. You just remind me of Moab. You remind me of the death. You remind me of the destruction. Get out of here. Go, my daughter. Let me be Mara. Let me be depressed. I'm just going to sit here and stare and look at the wall. Look at verse 10. And she fell on her face, and she bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found what? Grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. Why are you even taking knowledge of me, Ruth says? Verse 11, And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. I've heard good things about you, lady. Look at verse number 17, if you would. Verse number 17. Notice, So she gleaned in the field until even... And beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Then she's going to go back to the house. Look at verse number 20. And Naomi said unto her, uh, her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. That's a very important verse for us. When they returned to Bethlehem, Naomi announced her identity crisis to anybody who will listen. Now, don't call me that. Hey, everybody. She announces to everybody she didn't want to be that anymore. I don't want to be Naomi. I want to be Mara. I want to be Mara. Identity crisis. Years ago, I was preaching in Washington, and this helped illustrate this particular story. I, I was minding my own business in the morning, getting breakfast, walking through, getting my breakfast. And I came to a spot where somebody else had their, their, their plate and, and such there, had a little tray. And so I started to go around it and try to set my, uh, set my plate where I could and do my dippings and pull out whatever it was that I was going to get. And this, this woman says, I'm sorry, that's my plate. And from there, it led to an entire chapter in her life story. I don't remember it all, but it went something like this. I've got five kids and four different husbands. I got evicted. I'm homeless. I don't know what I'm going to do. I had to give my goldfish away. Uh, my pet cats now uh, have all ran away from me. She rattled off, if you will, just going on. Uh, and it, it seemed like an eternity, but it was probably only just a few minutes. And I'm trying to slop, and I'm throwing food probably just as fast as I could, getting things on the counter and everything else, just trying to move along. And as I did, it seemed like she began to follow me. We're going over to where the drinks were. You ever tried to run away with anybody? Now, now listen to me. We haven't even been properly introduced yet. Amen. She doesn't know my name. I don't know her name. And I'm already hearing her life story. He's abandoned me, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do this. And she's, she's going, and I mean, she, she is just getting into this story. And it was almost as if you could picture it in this fashion. It was like somebody with no teeth. I'm dumb as a rock. I've got 27 shades of pink and chartreuse hair. And I, you know, I, I walk funny and I, 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 I don't have any money. I'm in debt up to my eyeballs to the tune of about $750 billion. Hey, would you like to get together with me? I'm thinking to myself, lady, if you're trying to attract me to you, it's not working very well. Amen. 
That's not the way you go about it. I finally said something to the effect of, uh, well, it sounds like a good time for God. And that was the last I saw of her. She left. Amen. She didn't want to talk about God. Can I say to you, the lady had an identity crisis. And listen to me carefully. She probably was in bad shape. She probably did have some deep concerns. You ever met anybody like that? Deep concerns? Come on now. Deep concerns. She had an identity crisis. No doubt she had some problems in her life. This is what I want to be known as. This is how I'm introducing myself to you. I'm a former drug addict. I'm a former alcoholic introducing herself in that kind of a fashion. A tragic kind of existence. Well, I want to say to you, when Naomi came back, she wanted everybody to know she'd been hurt. Let me tell you what happened to me. I've been hurt. God did this to me. She blamed God for what had happened to her. Naomi's interest in though enthusiasm peaked whenever you find that she brings home, if you will, grace from her hunt. She brought home a good ephah full of grace. Amen. And when she did, all of a sudden the enthusiasm starts to come into this as Naomi uh, begins to start thinking, now wait a minute, wait a minute now. She starts maybe kind of getting into this just a little bit. Look at verse number 20. Blessed be he of the Lord. It's like the fountain of joy begins to spring with new life. She can see God's plan coming together again. There's reason to get up, and there's reason to get involved, and there's reason to participate. Hope has is, is come forth again. Hope is reviving. Hey, I don't want to miss out on this golden opportunity, maybe she could say. She's starting to get into this a little bit. Look at chapter number 3 and verse number 18 as she has her conversation with her. Then she said, or said she, sit still, my daughter, until thou knowest how the Matter will fall, for the man will not rest until he hath finished the thing this day. Naomi uh, goes from being down and out and discouraged and thinking it was over with to giving insight and instructions to Ruth about how, how to date a Jewish man. Well, let me tell you how you date a Jewish man now, lady. Now, I don't know if she ever did that with Malon whenever Malon was there, but he's give, she's giving instructions now about how to do this thing. She's getting involved in her Ruth ministry again. The excitement is starting to come back. She's starting to sense the work of God is alive and well. She began, if you will, to see the Spirit of God breathing life into her midst again. The caterpillar of discouragement is quickly blooming and blossoming, in, if you will, into a butterfly of delight. She can see that there's some change taking place. God hasn't forgotten me. She, she was still very much on the mind of God. She still was very much in the plans of what God had to do still. They're in Bethlehem, Judah. She could see it. It's changing her demeanor. It's changing her attitude. Look at chapter number 4. This thing wasn't over by a long shot. Look at verse number 9, if you would. Chapter number 4, verse number 9. And Boaz said unto the, unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Well, it was a good day. Seems like she had had a windfall. Amen. She come back to Bethlehem, Judah, not knowing where she was, how she was going to do and where, how she was going to make ends meet and how life was going to work out for her. And now God's beginning to work all this thing together. She's right there in a good spot. God's bringing her right back into his favor again, and she can start to see that God is working in her life again. Look at verse number 10. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabite, is the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead unto, upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. Oh, this is a good thing. Hey, listen, there's yet a name to be raised up. He gives them the understanding i got to raise up a name here. Look at verse number 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went into her, unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a what? A son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. Look at this. God's got a plan coming together. Look at verse number 15. And he shall be unto thee a what? A restorer of thy life. You're going to get your life back. I thought it was over with. I thought it was done. No, you're going to get your life back. 
and a nourisher of thine own age, for thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. She's going to take the child, she puts it in her bosom, it becomes a nursemaid unto it. Look at verse 17, and the woman... Her na- or the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born in Na- to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of who? David. You know the story. Ruth tragically lost her husband. But she embraced the new one that God is bringing into her life. And Naomi found that she could... Get past sitting and soaking and souring that there was life to be had as she began to get back to what? Ministering. She had pledged when she came back home that she didn't want to be involved in it, but now all of a sudden she sees that there's work to do. And she found that ministering to Ruth and teaching her how to properly date a Jewish man is going to take away her misery. Ministry replaced her misery, and it will every time. You know how you feel a little bit better about your circumstance and what's going on with you? Get to ministering. Go and talk to somebody. Tell somebody else about the Lord Jesus Christ. I understand that Naomi means pleasantness. She got back to her name. She got back to her name. She got her name back. She's not bitter anymore. She's not bitter Mara anymore. She's not miserable Mara anymore. She's pleasantness again. She must have been a joy to be around. She's smiling at everybody. And how you doing? Good to see you. You know, a person like that is much more attractive than somebody like Amara. Much more attractive to be around somebody that has the joy, joy, joy down in their heart. Somebody that's understood, since Jesus came into my heart, there's a joy, there's an excitement. You want to be around somebody like that. You don't be around somebody that's got, got uh, looks like that they, they've got their problems and will share it with you all the time about what's wrong and the world's falling apart. Ministering. Naomi could shout about it. Why? Because it's not over. It's not done. Everything's going to be okay. Look, if you will, at 1 Samuel chapter number 4. Hope is not always found in what you want, but it is always present in what God gives you. It's not always found in what you want, but it will always be present in what God gives you. There will always be hope. Ruth, the stranger, the foreigner, the Moabitist, was the good that came out of the bad. She was the good that came out of the bad. And who else found that out? Joseph did. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. God inserts good into some of the most horrible situations that people could think of. What a mighty God that we serve. Uh, Joseph was focused not on the hurt, but his eyes were fixed on the healer. You spend all your time being focused on the hurt, you don't ever see the healer the way you need to. Joseph did. You meant it for evil, my brothers. But God meant it to what? He meant it into good. To do what? To save much people alive. Can you see the good built into it? Naomi could. What do we see? We see a sacrificed a young lady who's sacrificed. We see her surrender. We see that she's committed herself to serve Naomi. God's plan w- was made known. There was still work to do. Why? King David was yet to come. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 4. Everybody doing all right so far? 1 Kings chapter number 4. Look at verse number 19. The daughter-in-law, Phineas, wife, was with child, near to be delivered, When she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bound herself in travail and her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. She's trying to make her feel good about what's taken place, trying to help her understand Maybe some good that was there, but she answered not, neither did she regard it. After hearing all the bad news that she heard, she only came to one conclusion, Ichabod. The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel. The ark of God is taken. And her conclusion was, Ichabod. Ichabod, she cried. It's over. That's it. Ichabod. It was her dying word. 
It was a negative perspective of one who was dying. How'd you like to go through life with a name like Ichabod? Anybody want to be named Ichabod? Anybody want to name their children Ichabod? Amen? No. Ichabod. It's over. It's done. What does your name mean? It means it's done. It's over with. God's plan's finished. No, God's plan wasn't finished. You know what his plan was? His plan was to withhold a child from a woman by the name of Hannah. Now, he withheld this child from Hannah, not because she didn't want her to have children. He very much wanted her to have children. Has God ever withheld something from you that he actually wants you to have? Sure he has. What's that do? And increases your desire for it. Amen. Come on now. I want it more. I want it more. Oh, God, give me a baby. Please, God, give me a, God, give me a baby. She wanted a baby so bad she made a deal with God. You know what she made? She made a faith promise. You'll give me a child, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. So guess what? God got what he wanted. And what happens at Israel? Well, Israel's going to get a new prophet. It got stinky around there. People abhorred the offering of the Lord, remember? Got kind of stinky with the way that things had happened. And God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take and break this woman, and as I break her, it's almost like that woman with the alabaster box of ointment. You know how God broke her? Guess what? She came into a stinky situation too, didn't she? Simon's looking, and greed is there, and Judas is greed, and the covetousness was there. And that place must have stunk spiritually to high heaven. Is everybody all right? But all of a sudden, this woman comes in, and with sacrifice and surrender, she becomes broken open. And she's weeping, she, she's crying, and she's there at Jesus' feet. And Jesus is going to do that, and he's going to take, do to take her offering and bring it in. Guess what? It brought a heavenly refreshment, a sweet-smelling savor, acceptable in the sight of God. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Because of brokenness. David understood with regards to what he had done. Guess what? Some brokenness brought back some refreshment. Created me a clean heart, oh God. And it changed things. It brought life back again. It's not over with. Everything's going to be all right. The tragic series of situations that had taken place, God had grace and hope that was already running. There's a plan that was already running. Here's the way the boys are acting. Here's the way Eli's sons are acting. But guess what? God had a parallel plan that was running right beside of it. Why? Because he can see farther than you and I can. When the bad stuff starts to happen, God's got already a good plan that started on the other side, ready to go, right, right beside of it. Amen. Come on now. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was great before the Lord, and the men abhorred the offering of the Lord, the Bible says. But in verse number 26, it says, And the child Samuel grew and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Here's Samuel being raised up. Why? Because his mama made a sacrifice. She surrendered. She committed herself to God, and God's going to be able to be restored back to his rightful place in their lives. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him and did let none of the words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Oh, it's a wonderful picture. At the same time, God has a plan. It's not over with yet. Look at Matthew chapter number 26 and Mark chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 26. The disciples thought it was over two at a time, didn't they? They thought that it was over with. They had pledged their life to Jesus in a very wonderful way. Verse number 31 of Matthew chapter number 26. Then saith Jesus unto them, All you shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter disagreed with the word, didn't he? Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. They all said the same thing. But then in verse number 56, we know 
But all, that w all this was done that the Scripture might be fulfilled, if you will, the Scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and, say that word with me, fled. After making a commitment to him, they fled, just like Jesus said they would. Look at verse 74. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. At first, they could not see any circumstance that would cause them to quit Jesus. And then they could not see any reason to stay. Are you with me? First, they have no, no, nothing that they could possibly think of. No, 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 we're with you to death do us part. We're with you. They couldn't see any circumstance that would take them away. But there came one, didn't they? Then they were ready to quit Jesus. And then they couldn't find any reason to stay. Guess what? It's over. That's their conclusion. It's over. No doubt they must have felt defeated. No doubt they must have felt disillusioned. They might have even felt deceived. We committed our life to you. We committed our, uh, we gave up our families. We gave up our jobs. We gave up all of these many different things. And look, look what you've done. This certainly wasn't turning out the way they wanted. It certainly wasn't turning out the way they planned. They invested everything, and now look at it. It's what? It's over. Would you say it one time with me? It's over. Say it one more time. It's over. That's what they felt. They felt it was over with. What's the use? We're not staying around here. We know the passage where they went fishing. Let's go to try to see if we can get up the old business again. See if we can get good at fishing again, and it didn't work out for them going back to the old business, did it? They couldn't catch anything. Come on now. It won't ever work trying to go back to the old life and try to revive it once you get saved. Come on now, amen. amen. It doesn't work that way. He won't let you be happy there anymore. Amen. It's an old address. Check out and be gone forever. They can't go back. Look at Mark chapter number 16. Matthew 26, we find Peter and the others making a very strong commitment to Christ, ready to die for him. Oh, we're going to die with you, Jesus, but we won't turn back. And then they scattered, just as Jesus said that they would. And his denial was stronger than the commitment that he had made to stay. Cursing, saying, I know not the man. Peter, is that you? Is that you saying that? Look at Mark chapter number 16. Look at verse number 5 with me, please. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw the young men sitting there, and they get word, guess what? Jesus isn't dead. Verse number 6, You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter. You've heard it said before, no doubt, that Peter got that special invitation. But he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him, as he said unto you. It's just like what he told you. They're going to go away. And Jesus goes and he meets up with Mary Magdalene. And then she tells him to, or, or he tells her to go. And I want you to go tell the, the disciples. And they, when they had heard that he was alive, verse number 11, and had seen her, believed what? Believed not. They were there in that room hiding. Because they didn't understand or they didn't hear the terminology that Jesus had said. What did he say? Jesus said it is what? It is finished. Say it with me. It is finished. They either didn't understand the terminology or they didn't hear it when he said it. And so then we find him in verse number 12, after he had appeared in another form unto two of them, as they walked down the road to Emmaus, and he, he tells them, hey, listen, you need to go down and tell them, guys. Verse number 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. He upbraids them, he reproaches them for their unbelief. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse number uh, 19, if you would. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Mary goes and tells the disciples, hey, listen, I want, you, I want you to know I've got good news for you. It's not over. It isn't over. This thing is still together. He's alive. He's risen, just as he said to you. Because he lives, everything's going to be all right. But they didn't believe because they thought it was what? Over. 
You know, sometimes it's hard even if somebody tries to tell you, somebody maybe even that you trust comes in and says, hey, listen, I got good news. It's hard to hear the good news. If your heart is as heavy and weighty as Naomi's was, it's hard to hear good news. Say amen with me, amen. amen. We've all been there at some times of discouragement. It's hard, no matter what anybody says to you, some of the most well-intended, most well-meaning people can say the one, the most wonderful words and best things to you, and guess what? Somehow it just doesn't kind of fit. It's like words for somebody else. It's not words for you. Jesus walked into the room, if you will. You know why I believe that he walked in? Instead of going through the door, just kind of appeared in their midst, went through the walls perhaps, or just descended into the center of them. He didn't knock on the door because they wouldn't have answered. They were too scared. They weren't looking to answer the door for anybody. Might be those Jews coming to get them, and they were going to be crucified next. They're too fearful to answer the door. So he comes in to do what? Calm their fears. Settle their doubts. We find in Revelation chapter 13, as Brother Marshall pointed out to us this morning, about Jesus standing at the door and knocking. I want to say to you that sin will keep him away. He doesn't come into the midst of sin. He will stand at the door and what? Knock. Return unto me, Israel. I'll take you back. Just return unto me. Is everybody all right? Come to me. But with regards to fear, he'll come to the rescue. And he went right into their midst. He's trying to help them, and he's trying to get them back to doing the business of the gospel. And he gets in, he calms them, and lets them see him, and helps them to understand, listen, it's not over, it's not done. Hey, guys, listen, I need you to get back to the gospel message. I need you to get back. I go into all the world and preach the gospel. There's yet work to do. We've got a lot of stuff to do. Get up out of your chairs and let's get moving. Let's get going. He's motivating him. He's inspiring him. He's telling him to get back to the work. It's not over. It's not done. But it is finished. It's not over. And it's not done. But it is finished. Let me say that again. It's not over. And it's not done. But it is finished. And that's where he went. He went to the right hand of the Father to say, It's finished. It's done. You can get back to work now. There's no reason for you to be down and out and discouraged and hiding out from the Jews. We got much work to do. He lets them know, hey, listen, the glory days are yet ahead. Jesus isn't dethroned. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. It isn't over, but it is finished. The dead in Christ shall rise. The sun is going to come up in the morning. One day it's going to come up and it's never going to go down again. Say amen to that. The tears will be forever gone. Cancer is going to be gone. Sickness is going to be gone. Pain is going to be gone. Sorrow is going to be gone. Doubt is going to be gone. Blindness is going to be gone. Death is going to be gone. And justice will be served on the devil because he's the true enemy and he's going to be locked up forever. And let me tell you, dear, sweet, faithful people, it isn't over, but it is finished. Get back to preaching, he says. I, uh, I got news about what had happened here so many months ago. The day I got news, it broke my heart. I said what I said to you at the very beginning because I want you to understand, I didn't go to Howes Anderson College. I didn't grow up, grow up knowing who Jack Howes was. I might have heard his name before. I didn't know those things. I've had a lot of friends as I pastored out in California who were graduates of Howes Anderson that I just, I connected with them. Do you understand what I mean? I say, do you understand what I mean? Connected with them. I found, I found a connection. Kindred spirit, soul winning and missions. So when I heard I wept. And I began to pray. I began to pray for this church. And by the way, listen to me. I thought it was my duty. A leading church in our nation involved in gospel around the world. I thought it was my duty. I began to pray. 
And almost immediately, God brought one name to mind. I didn't share my thoughts. I didn't tell anybody else. But I began, began to pray that John Wilkerson would become your pastor. Within hours, before there was a topic or anybody would bring it up, God put it in my heart. Somebody finally asked me, a friend of mine finally asked me, he said, who do you think? I said, I, I know who their pastor ought to be. It was my choice. I know who I'd pick. I'd pick John Wilkerson. He's so gracious and so loving and so kind. Listen to these words. He's lovable. He's teachable. He's approachable. I've been so thrilled by watching him ride the buses. See him get on the bus and get on Twitter, get a little snapshot of him riding the buses with the, the teens. That's John Wilkerson. Getting in with the people. I heard about him going to basketball games and how he sat with the people. You'll, you'll begin to think you see John Wilkerson everywhere. You'll think there's two of them. <laughs> you'll think there's 20. You'll say, how in the world can he be over here? I thought he was over there. Say amen. Come on now. You'll think you see him everywhere. And as I say, he probably won't like me saying these things to you. He probably won't like it at all. But I was so thrilled to find out that John Wilkerson was going to be your pastor. I can't even tell you. I say to you this. It's not over, but it is finished. I don't believe that there... Please listen this carefully. I thought long and hard about this statement, so please listen to it. I'm nobody. I'm absolutely nobody. I'm not trying to be anybody significant to you. I don't believe that there's a church in America that's more poised and positioned for revival than this one. And revival is my business. It's what I do. The conditions are ripe for the Almighty God to touch this place with revival. You give Him your heart, you pour out your heart to Him, whether it's sin or whether it's fear or whatever it is with you, and you'll beg God for revival. I believe your best days are yet ahead of you. The best is yet to come, Brother McKinney. It ain't over yet, but it is finished. There's college students that are high school students now that need a surrender because it ain't over, but it is finished. Ruth the Moabite has said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. Grace and hope are available. But Naomi didn't go looking for it. So guess what? Somebody else had to come and what? Bring it to her. And sometimes it's necessary for somebody else to bring us grace and hope because we just don't got it. Is everybody okay with me saying that? And so guess what? God did. I want to tell you something. I'm sticking with you like glue. I am not leaving. And eventually, guess what? Naomi had a ministry. She's going to have to teach Ruth, if you will, how to date a Jewish man. Amen. The ephah of hope energized her, brought her back, took her out, took and gave her life again. You know what I say to you? Get involved in the spring program. Participate in Super Saturday Soul Winning. Get involved in a bus ministry. Ask one of these pastors up here how you can get involved in what you can do. Because it ain't over. But it is finished.